being critical. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. So Ivy, are you there? Yes. Okay, Ivy. So after- I don't have a uh, camera, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, after class though, then we have the next class, right? Yes. Okay, so life will go on. Um, all right, so we're reading the ion. And did you look at the recording from the last class? Uh, you posted it. Class yesterday. Uh, no, I did not, but I will today after uh, at 12. All right. So you think you're going to be able to catch up pretty soon, Ivy? Yeah. OK. I just worry about you, that's all. But I want both of you to know that I want to do my job and I will be available. I only have, you know, three students and I can be there for you. The fact that I'm on the other side of the world doesn't mean anything. Um, there's always time. All right. Okay, so Plato is explaining how they lost their democracy. Now, the story of Ion and also Euthyphro, but um, is what was happening in the public's, um, the presentation of the most sacred books and the most influential books that tried to educate people about how to live, right? So does that happen in the US? Um, is the Bible, actually, it's got a lot of insights and you could actually learn how to live by reading it. And you could have preachers who really are, that's their mission, you know, is to quote from the text in a way that inspires people to live virtuously, right? Yeah. But the trouble is, <laughs> there's a lot of different kinds of preachers and reciters, and there's a lot of corruption among the people reciting it, especially when they have ulterior motives. So mm -hmm. do some preachers, their real motive is the mega church. They wanna get the biggest church and the most money. You think there are preachers like that? Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Jesus had trouble with them. They were called the Sadducees. But all right. And then there were the fundamentalists um, who are so obsessed about um, everybody following these rules that they don't even care about people anymore. They care more about the rules than the people. And they use the rules to denigrate people, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So fundamentalism also can turn religion upside down into exactly what it's not supposed to be, <laughs> right? You don't forgive people. You do judge people. You do exactly the opposite of what Jesus taught. Anyway, so what's going on with Ion? Um, so here we are, I don't know, you gotta picture this, right? There's this festival of Asclepius. It's down in Epidaurus. So literally I've been to Epidaurus, I don't know, seven times. And I have actually stood at the place where Ion probably recited this stuff, okay? <laughs> It's, so, it's exciting, right? It's exciting to be there because it's, it's high up. And so the people are standing beneath him. And so the, the, it projects, like his voice can project. All right, so um, the Asclepius was a son of Apollo, the god of reason. That makes sense, right? Reason, you use your reason in order to to develop medicine, the whole medical profession is based on science in reasoning. But Asclepius abuses his power and he brings someone back to life. And you're not supposed to change the natural order, right? With your powers. 
Does that make sense to you guys? That's pride. That's overstepping your bounds. And yeah. Um, yeah, okay, he's punished for that. That's even a god is not supposed to do that. You don't bring mortals back to life. <laughs> like they're dead, they're dead. Um, but then everything has an analogy with psychologically, okay? So there's the physical and the spiritual. All right. So when you go to Asclepius, if somebody's sick, usually people are on their last legs by the time they get there. They've tried all this stuff back at home in their city state. It's like the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And you come and first of all, they have a sweat lodge where you eat these certain herbs and you go into this hot sweat lodge. And actually those herbs have been shown to bring about really vivid dreams. And so they have dreams that are trying to, to understand if the gods are angry, you know, what their relation to the gods is that's causing them to be so sick. So first you have this sort of spiritual, and then you go to the physical doctor and you get your medicines and you get your therapies. And you also go to the theater to flush out these bad emotions. And there's also an Olympic track. So you're supposed to get in shape, right? So it's a very holistic view. Um, but so obviously then it's very, uh, it's so interesting, right? They have a theater and they have a place to recite because reciting Homer and reciting tragedies, or actually reciting Homer, performing tragedies, but you recite, is about flushing out these sick emotions, these emotions that are making you spiritually sick, right? And yeah. so Ion is here at the festival of Asclepius reading Homer, right? So this is supposed to be spiritual health week <laughs> so when you yeah. do wellness you got to have spiritual health not just physical health so um so this is a major festival the major focus is spiritual well-being so if this is corrupted you're in trouble right the society's in trouble um ion is the most popular rat rhapsode He's the one that people like the most. So obviously Socrates is going to ask him, Ion, tell me, you know, what do you know that makes you so able to do this? And those books are so important because they teach us about war and peace and justice and injustice and virtue and vice. They teach us about all the most serious questions in life. These are all the things that we argue about all the time. This is what totally makes a difference between the spiritual health and the spiritual sickness of the society. So Ion, I really wanna know from you, like what sort of spiritual magic are you performing, <laughs> right? Um, so that's important. The setting is really important. And then Socrates says, um, Ion, I'm so jealous of you because you must spend your life studying what the moral messages are of Homer, like the most profound writer. And so you get to spend your life thinking about it and then presenting those insights to the public. And, you know, Socrates would say, I'm so jealous. Like, that's what I would love to do. <laughs> Okay, does everybody understand that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, what does Ion say? Right? <coughs> what does Ion say when Socrates says that? Well, Ion is all dressed up. He's embellished. His body is embellished, right? And he does tell you that he just won first prize. So he has received glory, right? So he, he has honor um, and he has uh, pleasure, right? And then, um, and then 
Socrates says, well, I bet you also can recite Hesiod and these other poets because they all talk about the same subject matter, mm -hmm. good and evil, justice and injustice. So if you think about those things, you would be able to recite more than just Homer. Does that make sense? You, okay. Yeah. What does Ion say? He can't. That's right. <laughs> I mean, all right. So uh, what do you think about that? Do you think, I think there might be a problem here? Mm -hmm. that he doesn't really understand all of the perspectives. He just understands um, the story, if that makes sense. And what's his motive? Is his motive to express it's just emotion? amusement? What? It this is just um it's just amusement, right? Right, exactly. Does that make or magic, you know, getting them to yeah. worship him? So it's either just amusing them, or you could say he has an outcome he wants, which is to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, are there ministers like that? Or are there people who recite the Bible with ulterior motives in mind? Yes. I can <laughs> definitely say yes. Okay, can you think of some examples off the top? Ted Cruz is one of them. Um, <laughs> I would say <laughs> Supreme Court justices as well. Those are definitely some good options. Um, anybody that that is anti-socialist but also still loves Jesus, um, that's that's a weird place to be in my head, at least. Especially since the early church was totally communist. And then uh, really? also, every, also religious people against free health care. I mean, Jesus literally went around healing everybody. <laughs> yeah there's also the uh money ballad at church you know where they send the little hat around and put money in it i feel like it's kind of sus um okay good um and then i remember sitting in a restaurant tai lee you know 10 years ago 15 whatever and it was when the george bush uh people I don't like, <laughs> were manipulating working class people and getting them to want to go to the war in Iraq and all that. And I felt really bad about these people because they have good intentions and they're just getting jerked around, right? So yeah. I was listening to them talk and they were, they'd just been at church, you know, and then they start analyzing the service as if it's a performance, right? As if they're going to uh, something at a convention center to be entertained. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're just analyzing it according to whether it's good entertainment. <laughs> and then what they want for Christmas is a bigger TV. And then it's just like, come on, nobody's trying. Like nobody's trying to think about what's going on. Um, but anyway, but that's what's going on here, right? Is that Ion's presentations of Homer are really just entertainment. They're just performances. Um, so then this, the dialogue is in thirds. The first third, Socrates says, well, you must be able to talk about these other things. And then Ion says, no, but okay, Socrates, you tell me why that is, right? Um, and Socrates, Socrates says, I'm only a simple person. I only talk in very simple talk, you know? So now you have this contrast between Ion that embellishes Homer, embellishes his body and gets glory. So what does that tell you about the Athenians that Ion gets number one from the critics, the art critics, right? And then he gets voted in by the audience. Again, this goes back to Collingwood, right? If, 
if the society doesn't know the difference between art and entertainment or amusement, and then the critic, his job is to just be an enabler, basically, of the whole process, then you've got, you know, the spiral downward. You just, you have false consciousness. You have a corrupt society. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. Does that work for you, Ivy? Yeah, I get what you're saying. Okay. So then um, Socrates has to explain to Ion <laughs> why. And he's not going to say, because you're a jerk, Ion, you're a fake. <laughs> so the next move he makes is he flatters Ion, okay? He says, oh, um, it's because you're a poet and a poet is a light and winged thing and reason is not in him, you know? Like you're in this ecstatic situation. Well, go back to Rollo May, the ecstatic, right? Art has this, something to do with getting outside of banal consciousness, getting in touch with something deeper, right? And so Socrates, at, at the end of the first section, he says, I only speak really simple language, you know. Well, then he gives this huge embellished speech. He does exactly the opposite of what we just said he did, right? Oh, a, a poet is a light, and there's this lodestone, and it has this inspiration, and that 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 goes through the, the poet, Homer, and then from Homer to Ion, from Ion to the audience, this big ecstasy, right? And again, Collingwood would say that when it's good, that's true. <laughs> what about when it's bad, right? It's just, right? It's the same, looks the same. It's just totally different. But anyway, so he's giving this speech and Ion says, oh, Socrates, you've touched my soul, right? And so Socrates has figured out how to talk to Ion in a way that speaks to Ion and gets him to be emotional. So Socrates is just doing what Ion says that he does, right? He recites Homer in a way that gets everybody all worked up emotionally, right? Um, yeah. Without asking, is this are these healthy emotions? So what happens to Ion is he he gets him to be honest. And that's why there's nobody else around because if there were, Ion would be aware of his performance and he wouldn't be honest. But Socrates yeah. has tapped into his emotions and then Ion reveals this truth. He says, when I'm in front of them and I'm crying and they're laughing, I'm, I'm uh, crying be inside because they're not gonna pay me. Whereas if I'm, up there performing and they're crying, then I'm laughing because I'm going to get paid. So all of a sudden he reveals his real motive, right? Which is money. Um, again, that's a corruption, right? What if somebody recited the Bible just to make money? They would become cynical after a while, right? Like Marxism, right? The opiate of the people. Well, it's, you know, I might as well cash in on this, you know? Um, so the second section then shows that Ion's really in it for the money. And the reader should say, this is why artists have to be accountable. They have to, they or somebody like a critic has to tie the inspiration down with a reason and account. Um, or else it can become really corrupt. And people could say, oh, well, it was very inspiring. Well, yeah, what did inspire in you? <laughs> and because people get inspired by evil as well as good. So there needs to be an account. And, and Collingwood said that too, right? So there, a good critic will tell an artist if they've gotten corrupted or not. Just like a good critic of Ion's performances should be able to say, Ion lost it. Like all he cares about is money and fame. Does that make sense? And yeah. it's not it's not happening. Like all this stuff has become corrupted. Um, so that's the second section. So 
The first section was glory, second section money, and explaining why you have to link artistic inspiration to some kind of an account. And then the third section, he says, um, Socrates has said, so you don't have any knowledge. You're just totally out of your mind. Well, then Ian is not flattered anymore. He said, wait a second. I do have knowledge. I have a skill. Well, and so then Socrates is, you know, well, what kind of skill is that? And so the reader should figure out, well, it's the skill of knowing how to use words to manipulate people, obviously. Um, but Socrates first says, oh, is it like when Homer talks about the chariot ride? You know, I mean, he's teaching you how to drive a chariot or when Homer's talking about fishing and is that teaching you how to fish? And, you know, if you look at the quotes, it's not at all about the literal, you know, activity. It's about spiritual, right? It's what's going on spiritually. Um, somebody was telling their kid how to cheat in a chariot race or something, right? It wasn't at all about teaching someone how to, how to run chariots. But Ion, again, doesn't want to admit he doesn't know anything. And so he says, well, I know everything about, you know, everything in Homer. Well, then he talks about, I know how to, to speak um, appropriately, right? I know what a, a man should say and what a woman should say. And so what he does know, his skill is to know how to speak in a way that convinces people, right? And so the next, that goes to power. He really thinks the Athenians should assign him a generalship and to lead the troops. Well, what is it? Why should Ion lead the troops? And why shouldn't he lead the troops? What do you, given what he's said so far, what do you think? Um, goodness gracious. Well, I don't think he should lead the troops in the most literal sense. Why? Um, He, uh, he has an understanding of at least part of the human condition, but I, I don't think that, I feel like there is a level of artistic understanding that you can go into leading troops and there's a level of understanding that he doesn't really need to. I mean, I, he can lead off, strictly off of the basis of understanding the importance of the emotional value of things, but even if he can understand it and he can, uh, let's say, bring a crowd to joy or bring a crowd to tears, that doesn't necessarily work all the time. Like, it's not going to be his thing. What about you, Ivy? I think he gets, like, the general concept. He just, he needs to change... Like, can you just repeat that? Mm. Do you think Ivan should get a generalship? Because oh. of what? He understands the, he understands the point of it, but he, I don't know how to explain it. Okay. Well, how about, in the first section, Homer like, is trying to teach people about justice and injustice. Should a yeah. good general have thought a lot about that stuff? I feel, yes. yes, I feel like he has yes. to understand both sides of it. He's just understanding one side of it. Is well, like, <laughs> and so because Homer, he's only understanding one side of it, he's not, he's being easily persuaded because they, you know, he's, he's kind of had like a blind side, if that makes sense. Well, Homer is sense. trying to teach people about war and peace, justice and injustice. 
It's yes. much better to do diplomacy than war. It's an anti-war war story because there's so much damage that gets done and people, nothing gets solved. So, you know, a good general should really study Homer and the lessons of Homer and not be eager to go to war to solve problems because the Iliad shows you that it doesn't solve problems. Don't glorify war. Don't overreact. Don't don't allow brutality, right? War is, is so difficult because people are so afraid that they will get brutal. They'll just start on rampages. So a general is, it's really a difficult. And you have to have thought a lot about that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then the other thing you need are these literal skills, strategy skills so, okay, we do have to fight this battle. How can we strategize in a way to minimum the damage that's done? And Ion says he has a whole lot of skills and knowledge, but he never talks about <laughs> the particular skills related to being a general. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, so he, he thinks he has all this knowledge, but he really doesn't. He doesn't have the wisdom. He doesn't have or the, the experience, the technical skills. He doesn't have experience. What's the one thing he has? Just um, artwork. An Understanding idea. he is oratory. Power. He can get he can get those troops frothing at the mouth, right? I can get them up so that they will go out and fight, right? But. Is that what you want? Just these troops that are blindly sort of frothing at the mouth to go get the enemy? Is that what you really want in your troops? You know, it's only not really, not really. <laughs> Having them frothing might be nice if it's just straight up hand-to-hand -hand combat, but for any major battle, there's gonna be adrenaline. That's not gonna be an issue once they're there. Um, but they're, they, it, it's a, it's a very heady game. I mean, they're about to die. So they gotta be, they have to have their wits about them. Right. But that's why the general has to be clear about the strategy and tell them once you do that, you hightail it back here, you know, don't go kill people unnecessarily. Right. Yeah. And the general would also have considered whether this is a just war whether there was some other diplomatic solution. I mean, the general should really have a lot of in-depth understanding. Otherwise, what, is, what does Ian think? He thinks all that matters is everybody's on board and everybody's so emotionally engaged and then you'll be successful. Is yeah. that true? No. No, because then a city values war more than anything else. Well, that's, uh, are you gonna have a democracy if all you have are citizens that just can't get enough of killing enemies? <laughs> no, you're gonna have a war state, right? But that's all Ian cares about. Okay, so today in various countries like Brazil, well, actually, Mr. Dr. Oz, um, how many people are there that are good rhetoricians, right? They succeed on TV, they're good entertainers, and then they run for president or political office. Uh, I.e. somebody we both know who is really good on a reality TV show, right? Pretty bad at his job. Well, can you see why? I mean, it's very similar, right? People got entertained by this guy. So he moved them emotionally. They get attached to him. Well, then he, he runs for office. And that's what Ion's doing. Does that make sense to you all? Yeah. Um, that these patterns just keep reappearing. <laughs> and we, you know, we need to learn stuff. We, and um, Plato's dialogues were for the future leaders in every sector of society. So 
if you could get this message from the ion, whatever you're leading, if you're leading a business, you're leading a school, you're leading anything, you, you know, make sure to contain, you want people to, to be inspired, but you don't want to just appeal to pure emotion and or the desire to be popular or the desire to make money or be successful without paying attention to whether or not you're corrupting the souls of the people that you can control, right? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. All you've got is a bunch of rhetoricians uh, manipulating people for their own personal gain. And then you don't have a democracy. Does that click with people? Yeah, it, yeah, it clicks. Makes sense. Does that make sense, Ivy? Yes. So how much before 9-11, especially political advertisements were entertainment all the way. You know, they, they would, present this fantasy you know if you vote for me you can have the house and the burbs with the two two cars and the dog and all that but after 9-11 then it's an appeal to fear right oh you know if you don't vote for me you're gonna get you know blah blah but it's all about emotional appeal and the 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 better your rhetoric the one with the rhetoric that manipulates people's emotions the most wins. And if you can quote the Bible, you know, that's an additional thing. Because any sort of counter to that, you've taken the medicine and turned it into the disease, right? Okay, so I think that's what's happening. So on the one hand, um, Liam, you said it's about deep and powerful emotions, right? Yeah. It's just that, yeah, but they're corrupt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That makes more sense now, for sure. And that's where Collingwood, like, you know, Collingwood, I want to agree with you, but how are you going to, who gets to decide what a deep and powerful emotion is, you know? Yeah. And um, who are you to tell me this is psycho art? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it moves me a lot, you know. Um, so there's that problem. How do you, I mean, certainly art has to be about deep and powerful emotions. And then the question is, how do you make it a authentic consciousness? You know, a consciousness that's oriented toward truth and justice and what you want, as opposed to this a, you know, this powerful tool we have to um, use speech to really manipulate each other and really believe we're doing the right thing. That's the other thing. You can have good intentions and yet it's corrupt. Um, so that was um, any, um, do you have any comments, any final comments or reactions or any questions? Ivy, do you think when you go back and study it more, it will fall into place? You kind of have a general yeah. idea. Yeah, I, um, when I read it, it was I understood what um, Socrates was trying to do with the questions and everything. I understood that I uh, didn't really have field experience. He was just entertained by the story that um, you know the guy was giving, but when he was questioned about other things he wasn't able to back it up but now I feel like with this I'm able to explain it better you know okay well particularly when Perfect. you have a society's most profound books for moral teachings and you turn that into the disease rather than the medicine you I mean mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you going to do now like, how are you going to fix it if even the Bible has been totally corrupted? I don't know, guys. You got any suggestions? I 
Uh, I don't know how to fix religion. I <laughs> would think you'd have to self reflect. You'd have to what? But <laughs> like compare <clears throat> to other things, not just take what's there and run with it. <clears throat> that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then also, there's analogies. So you can compare. Um, some of those mega church guys, I suppose Ted Cruz probably goes to a mega church because that's how you get votes. Um, with the Sadducees, right? That is who the Sadducees are, and Jesus really had trouble with them. <laughs> or the fundamentalists, and you just you have to try and show people there's an analogy there. Like we're making all the same mistakes, and so then you could write a poem. I mean, you could write a a play or um, a sermon or whatever that tries to get people to think critically. So, so can you tell that Plato, that's why I was going to get back to Liam and what, and Ivy, the ones you've read before. So when you're reading the Ion, it might seem like, oh, this is kind of all over the place, right? I mean, they're just having this conversation and he says something and he says something. But if you step back, right? And you reflect and you, you sort of let the whole story um, embed itself in your head, then you can see that, oh, there's a pattern there, right? It has three parts and it has three motives and it has, you know, and what appears to be is the opposite of what is, right? Socrates appears to be the simple guy. Actually, he's profound. He appears to only use simple language, actually uses just really embellished language. He's actually a better rhapsode on Ion's definition than, than Ion is in this particular context, because he's the one that taps into Ion's emotions, right? Um, but he taps into his corrupt emotions and so the reader is supposed to think well that's what ion does he taps into people's corrupt emotions like they want to feel sorry for themselves or they want to um they want to do all those irrational things that the guys in homer stories do whereas homer is is telling you that in order to show you don't do this like you'll want to do this don't do this and Ion is saying, oh, yeah, like, this is cool. He describes all this stuff, and it feels so good, you know, to just rail at the enemy. And I do think there are preachers who do that. Like, they do all the things you're not supposed to do in a sermon. They get people self-righteous. We're the good guys. And then projecting evil onto somebody else. That's exactly the opposite of what religion's supposed to do. But okay, so that's that's that. Now, um, what I wanted to do was show how it fits um, Aristotle's 11 criteria for tragedy. So let's go back. So we have all these themes from last time, right? Essentialism versus existentialism. So we have an existential situation. There's a particular conversation between two particular historical beings. The thing is, Plato is a poet. And so he wasn't there at this conversation, but he knows this is the kind of thing that Ion was doing, or this is the kind of thing that the rhapsodes that were the most popular in Athens were doing. And, and so he's a kind of person in a kind of situation. And that's one of the factors that caused Athens to lose its democracy. It was just one, you know, there's like 20 dialogues about what was going on before the fall of Athens. But that would mean that these are archetypes. If you can, if you see these patterns and they're types of people and we still make those mistakes, that's a kind of essentialism, right? There's something about human nature and the human condition 
that is so deep and powerful that we keep making the same mistakes or somebody keeps trying to call us out on it so we don't make those mistakes. So every generation should be able to grasp what's going on deep down and figure out how their particular existential situation, these deep seated patterns are erupting, right? And they're motivating people unconsciously. But the artist is the one that can put those two together in a way that speaks to people because most people, it has to start with something visual that they can identify with. And then the poet leads them on the story. And then maybe it doesn't even register right away, but it might register. It might go, oh my God, that's me. Or, oh my God, that's my friend. Or, oh my God, that's my dad. Or it might, you know, ooh, I don't get it. And then you go down to the tavern and talk to somebody else and you realize, okay, people disagree on what this is and what's going on, or they just go home and it sits in the back of their head. Something happens and they go, oh my God, it's just like that story, <laughs> right? And so that's, that's the kind of education of the collective unconscious that um, mythology in general and um, Greek myth and then tragedy, but then Plato picks up on that. And he also, the characters in Plato are citizens in the city. They're not like, there's not a king and there's not an aristocrat per se. It's, and Socrates is a stone cutter and a stone cutter is allowed to talk to anybody, including the aristocrats. That was made Athens different. That was one thing that made Athens great. And the aristocrats even respected them uh, at the beginning before they started hating them. <laughs> but because he didn't flatter them, he didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. So that's the irony of Ion said, well, you just uh, learn about, tell, you teach people how they should talk, what a man should say, what a woman should say. Well, Socrates, is got himself killed because he didn't say what he was supposed to say, right? He didn't say what was socially acceptable. So that's also extremely ironic, right? So, you know, there's this reversal, what appears to be and what is. And the, the Athenians just couldn't tell the difference anymore. And they just thought Socrates was one more sophist. Um, and, and then they lost not only did they kill Socrates, but they lost their democracy. If you can't tell the difference between somebody who quotes the stuff with ulterior motives and somebody who's actually got their eye on the mark, right? They have a, a good idea of good and evil and justice, then you're in trouble. And you, you know, citizens really have to be able to make those distinctions to preserve your democracy. Um, so here's the, here is the 11 points. And again, the reason I bring this up is because this stuff wouldn't even remotely be true unless there was some sort of collective unconscious, right? Um, so in general, it's about emotional education. And uh, the goal is preserve uh, uh, mature people individuals and also collectively the citizens when they come together to make decisions about political life they are mature people so they'll be able to be somewhat on the same page and they'll be able to have meaningful debates um, when citizens just become cynical and all they do is talk to each other about the best way to manipulate the idiot masses you don't have democracy anymore, right? Um, yeah. yeah, okay. So the context um, and, and um, where the Olympic games were held, it's amazing how many uh, venues there were for reciting Homer. 
um, it's it's kind of like you recite the Bible before your uh, football game or something. <laughs> and um, obviously that that gets corrupted. Um, okay, so we have a natural pleasure in learning. When you can be able to see the analogies, um, it, it's pleasant. Um, and there are these recurring patterns. The plot is an imitation of an action. Um, what choices people make. So Ian made choices. Ian might have good opinions, but it's the choices he makes. It's who he really is as a person that counts. Whether he, whether he led Athens um, toward good or evil, and it's obvious that he's heading them in the wrong direction. Um, okay, so the Plato is trying to show you, here's a guy who's better than most, Socrates. Here's a guy that's worse than most because he, he was so influential in the corruption of the soul, um, of the people. Okay, these are serious questions. How to recite Homer is a serious issue. It's not an entertainment issue. Um, the characters. All right, so there aren't any intermediate characters. The readers have to be the ones that are have to look at Ion, look at Socrates, and then figure out, you know, what am I supposed to think about this? What am I supposed to learn from this? Um, and that the characters are true to type. So Ion is a type, and Socrates is a type. And the main character makes a mistake. So Ion himself makes a mistake in judgment, but the main people that make the mistake are the Athenians, because they can't tell the difference between Ion and um, Socrates. Um, and then they have this reversal from happiness to misery, they lose their city, and then from ignorance to wisdom, which Plato set up his academy to try and have people in for posterity 2400 years learn these lessons so that they don't make these mistakes now obviously given western history <laughs> they haven't always learned the mistakes right one example would be after world war one you know don't take revenge like how many greek tragedies in homer and plato don't take revenge don't take revenge did they pay attention to it? No. They created this very punitive treaty and they started World War II. It's just, okay, so the classicists, either the classicists had their head in the sand, they weren't even saying anything, or else they were being totally ignored. Um, so Plato tried to pass these lessons on. They're still relevant. They're still ignored, blah, blah. Um, Okay, we have to know why people made the choices um, because their decisions reveal their character. And so it does matter that Ion can get away with what he gets away with because the Athenians don't have ideas of good and evil in their head. They can't evaluate Ion according to any higher standard. As a matter of fact, you know, they evaluate him according to how he makes them feel which the same thing happened in the law courts when Socrates explaining. Socrates says, I'm not bringing my kids in here so you feel sorry for me and you vote to let me go just because of my kids because I want to argue that I'm a good citizen and you have to judge based on my way of life, not all these emotional appeals. Well, that made the jury pissed. Like, how come he doesn't play the game by the rules? Well, wait a second. The people who founded it didn't want lawyers who appealed to irrational emotions to win their case. That is not what they wanted. But the Athenians got to the point where they expected it and they resented it if you didn't do it. So exactly the same with Homer. Like, I don't want to learn anything from Homer. I want to feel, you know, whatever I want to feel. Um, okay, so we should be able to identify with these characters, I mean, with Ion, or at least with the Athenians. Okay, so you can understand how the Athenians got fooled 
and then, but I, we don't, I don't want to get fooled, right? We shouldn't get fooled. Plato wrote this for us so that we wouldn't, we'd learn. Um, all right, let's see. So that's, and then, um, all right. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, yes. Okay, so this, so far in the class, we had the Rollo May had some kind of an archetype response to beauty. And that's more like physical beauty, um, but it was harmony, remember? The harmony of your soul, the harmony of the spheres, the form, you know, that the things you look at have these basic underlying forms. Um, so it was something like that. It's just that this is a much more sophisticated, um, complex, um, it just really tries to think about a lot of different patterns that arise. And so the whole tradition over time, they kept adding things, but it was at that certain point in time in 800 BC that they had this aha, <laughs> aha, which is there are patterns. Like life isn't just the gods arbitrarily, you know, throwing their thunderbolts or having a bad hair day and killing your kid or something. We're not puppets of the gods. We actually, the gods gave us these powers of pattern recognition. So the poet has that power and knows they have it and it's sacred. Like they're closer to the gods because they can see what the gods gave us the ability to see so that we can take care of ourselves better. Um, does everybody understand? Do you understand that? Yeah. That when a society is healthy, the point is there, the universe is understandable. We have the ability to understand these patterns. And that was the whole point of why God gave it to us in the first place, right? We're supposed to do that. And you should have religious guilt if you don't use your mind and try to try to flourish, right? You were supposed to, God, the gods or God gave you this for that specific reason. But the, when, when religion becomes, oh no, just turn to God. Oh no, don't try to fix something, just turn to God. Oh no, you got sick because God is punishing you for something, not because you're eating all the wrong stuff, you're not exercising, we have all the information about this. There's no need for you to be sick. No, no, just turn to God. <laughs> like Then, if people don't govern themselves and they don't teach each other how to govern, then you, you're going to have chaos and you're going to have authoritarianism. You can't have democracy unless people take that responsibility for self-governance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so, so then you can decide, okay, this is a kind of art or is it art or is it magic or is it amusement or as it would be magic, right? Is it art or is it magic? Um, why or why not, right? Um, and then Berger's thing about the problem was that capitalism was helping promote material well-being, but then it got stuck into publicity and consumerism and all that. Um, but the, you know, the Greeks wouldn't say that. You can't blame the economic, you can't blame conditions. It's deeply embedded, and the only solution is to purge yourself of your irrational desires. And if you do that, you won't overconsume. If you do that, you'll be a very um, mature user of the economic system. And if if people buy what they need and they don't buy a bunch of junk, the economic system itself isn't evil. It's when it starts, people start using it to get rich or powerful that then all those capacities we have get dedicated to evil causes. Well, then the whole economy is a force of evil, but there's nothing inherent in, in any
Is she frozen or is that mine? No, I think she froze. Yep, there she go. She got it. Okay. Uh, well, it's class over. Okay, there we go. No, okay. Yes. All right. Got a little scared for a second there. I know. Um, so we have five minutes, and I'm going to shut up for five minutes. And you have to think of something to say. What would your takeaway be? Um, I think that that this goes further into the point that um, Berger made into other forms of corruption that art and artistic interpretation can have. Um, I would point to, I mean, you've already pointed to um, the use of like Bible and myth and things like that as, as uh, what's the word? Uh, I'll just use corruptible. Um, other things are definitely, that can definitely be corrupted are any other piece of artwork, so long as it is, you know, separated from its context. I think that that's going to be a point that gets reiterated over and over again, like putting things into the museum and then they're not, they're not the same. Um, another thing we can look at is go to any British museum and you've got plenty of things stolen from everywhere else. That the are Elgin kind of, marbles. <laughs> yeah. Things that are just kind of taken away that don't exist where they should exist. They just kind of stay in this nice prim and proper spot that was almost fully bought with money that was uh, also stolen. Um, and I mean, it, 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 it's easy to corrupt art when there's nothing there to protect it. And when people don't care, yeah. right? People don't yeah. hold people accountable for corruption because they either don't think the arts are powerful, which they are, yeah. um, or they they can't tell the difference between amusement and art, right? Yeah. Um, incidentally, the Greeks built a new Acropolis museum. Specifically, they have a floor all there ready to get the Elgin marbles back. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, but I mean, you go there, it's like, huh? <laughs> and it has this the little sign, won't. we're just waiting to get it. Anyway. The building won't be finished until they do. Yeah, uh, hint, 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 hint. Uh, you know, the counter argument was, well, then every country's gonna want all their stuff back. And- like, yeah, um, why would they not? <laughs> But then, oh, but then, you know, people can't just go to London and learn all this stuff about all these other cultures because, you know, not everybody can go travel to Athens or Amman. Um, so you can afford Jordan. to go to London. You can probably afford to go to Greece. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Amman, um, Jordan, you know, there's stuff from the Mideast. So anyway, okay, so here's the next question. What about what Berger says about the way that the study of the classics is part of that, mm. the way that the, the elite justifies their elitism? Well, we enjoy the classics, so, you know, we're superior. Well, if you actually read these books and Socrates is, is condemning all these people that are quoting from the classics for their own purposes. It's like, you guys don't read the lessons. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, I would definitely say that, I'm trying to remember what exactly Berger said, that it aligns with Dewey, so I'm gonna use the, the language of Dewey, that putting the museum conception of art into a museum is always going to separate it from the context it's made. And that that can easily be used to be, like we just discussed with like stealing cultural artifacts. And you can use those to like educate in a centralized area when there isn't any use in educating there with those artifacts when, when, when they should be in the situation back where they come from. So, Oh, heck, what point was I making? Why do well, I the, so 
the only real use it has is to maintain the power and privilege and sense of cultural superiority of the yeah. wealthy when, who build the museums. Yeah. Okay. I remember I remember where I was coming from. So that that once that is in the museum and it can be used to um what's the word? Let's say enlighten people, that it kind of just doesn't have any meaning anymore. That it is separated and kind of like kind of like creating the mass appeal of art on the internet where you can never actually see the piece it takes away all of the emotional investment that can be had. And it just creates this, again, I can say an ivory tower of viewership where there is no actual meaning behind the viewing. It, it is just being viewed. And I mean, then we get into the corruption of, of capitalism and art. And that's a whole different topic that also speaks to the corruption of like higher, higher, what's the word? High society art. Yeah, and so the question would be that um, Berger really, his story centers so much around capitalism and money, right? In the Renaissance painting, when the, when the artwork became this material object and it focused yeah. on material things and how capitalism changed culture so much. But I, my criticism is it's way too much focused on just capitalism. And people have a lot more other drives than just money. I mean, they have fear, they have vulnerability, and it causes them to do some real damage. So I just think it's too simplistic to place the, you know, to economic determinism is too simplistic. People are more complicated than that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if you are an economic determinist, then all you have to do is change the economy and people will absolutely change. And I just don't believe that at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so it's time. Um, and so the next class, was we're going to do um, just two days from now, right? Oh, Longinus. Okay, so this one is on great speeches. Um, did I ask you to, I didn't ask you to buy it, right? Oh, here it is, Longinus on the Sublime. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't think we bought that one. No, because I have it here. It's just, that's a crappy version of it. But if you can find a better version, go for it. Oh, my goodness. Anyway. Go for it. Yeah, I will too. Um, I have one question. Are, are we coming up on our first paper? Um, Isn't it like? Due pretty soon. Um, I don't remember if it was. Let's see. You had, I think in this class, you, how many papers do you have? I think you just have the one research paper and the final paper. Okay. Um, I couldn't remember if we had two or three and I, I couldn't remember if we had one coming up. Uh, let me make sure. Um, I think normally I give longer posts for this class. Let me see what, oh, it says 200 words. Oh no, that's the essay. Um, uh, oh, this says 200 word minimum for each day, but I think in the other stuff, it says 150. It's just, there's a research paper and a final paper. So, oh, yeah. Informally, I, I do wish you'd write more on the weekly posts, okay. right? Um, and so the date due for the paper would be, it's under the classwork. Um, I think that's listed there. Um, oh, the research paper is due November 15th, so it's not due okay. it's for quite not a while. Me. Um, okay. But I do think your final will be better. 
if you if you do your posts, you know, pretty longer. Okay, so next time it's longinus on the supply. Um, maybe I'll try to find it because it looks to me like that's a pretty tough read. Um, I'll, the other, I'll look for it. I should. I mean, heck. For all I know, there's one, a copy in the library and it'll be nice and easy. Do you think you could scan it at the library? Um, if I find one at the library, I will try and scan it, yeah. Well, and here are the page numbers because you don't have to read the whole thing. Okay, um, so yeah, if three the library to five, has- Three to one to 12. Um, now you might want to read the whole thing, you know, if you're majoring. Um, it's just that from page five to nine, 12 to 21, 23, you'll see that it's very specific and he gives specific examples. And so, you know, I only assign the general stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so it's really about, oh yeah. And you can go back to the original questions to get the main points too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's an outline to the book. So I'm sure you could get away with not even reading the book, but um, that's no fun. Try. Oh, geez, now Ivy's gone. It's just like, Ivy, you've got to come back. Anyway, um, all right, so I'll stop and I'll stop the recording and you can go. Yeah, I, I think the library does have a copy. Okay. So, um, okay, I will write that down on the to do list. Thanks. So scanning things, reading from scanning.